seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Howdy, Croc Nation. Dr. Tommy and Ellie here with you with another Croc podcast. Along with me, Angel Santana, Half Faith. Let it begin. Angel, welcome. Hey, what's going on, Dr. E? Hey, listen, I'm excited to be here. Um, I would like to just remind our Croc podcast and the Croc Nation, we are available every single weekday, every single weekday uh, on Sundays at 9 a.m. So we're asking you a big favor today. Subscribe, share, and like. Let everybody know that the Croc Podcast is there. That is how we're going to grow. Dr. E, it's always a pleasure. How are you, my friend? Well, as good Angel Santana, just wanted to say I'm just uh, honored to have you with me uh, to uh, continue our our fight and quest to try to advocate and um, make the lives of our survivor thrivers that much better. And I'm going to continue in the same vein. We've been on sort of a roll with uh, communication issues, uh, communication issues with your physician, what your physician is telling you about your care, about your procedures that are upcoming. Uh, And today we're going to take another lesson from our amazing thriver survivors I think I learn from you guys every day. I actually know I learn from you every day. And uh, this week was no different. So we're going to call today's podcast uh, two more days, question mark, question mark, uh, vantage point. So basically, um, again, on the theme of communication and watching our words, uh, this week's lesson is brought to you by one of our current um, croc radiation patients. Uh, I will withhold her name. Um, But she really um, is a wonderful person and really taught me a great lesson, a lesson that I really knew, but I guess I forgot. Um, In a nutshell, uh, basically, a patient comes in to see us for a consultation. We talk to them about many, many things. We talk to them about their cancer. We talk to them about their stage. We talk to them about their prognosis, and we put together a loosey-goosey treatment plan as far as that first day. Then there's a lot of things that happen between that first day and that first treatment. And in that midst, it's kind of like when you were a kid and you would play telephone, you would whisper into a friend's ear, um, you know, fee fi fo fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. And by the time it gets to the 10th person, it's like the Mets are the worst team in baseball and they're gonna continue to rip our hearts out and um and make us sad that's you know what happens when you play telephone and it's no different when a patient comes in and has that first consultation and when they come to their treatment it might be different and it's our responsibility to tell them uh, what the changes were and why and in this particular case the change in my mind was a very very subtle change a very nothing change but to her it was a very big deal and she made it known it was a big deal uh, so I'm going to going to devote my um, my podcast today to her and uh, this great lesson of her. So so again, in a nutshell, every word that we use, every word that we say to a patient, every sentence, every directive we issue, every recommendation we pursue, uh, it is our responsibility to be very clear and accurate. And if there is a change to what we tell them, uh, we need to take the time to discuss these changes. Um, so they're not blindsided by by um, this change of plan. And I actually learned this lesson because as a young doctor, um, radiation therapy is given in weeks. So there's five day work week. Uh, radiation goes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So it's pretty simple math. It's five days. So if someone is going to have 25 treatments, they're going to get five weeks of treatment. If they're going to get 30 treatments, that's six weeks of treatment. But what if they're going to get 28 days of treatment? So in the old days, I would say, well, you're going to get five weeks of treatment. And then on day 25, a therapist would come to me and say, you know, Mr. Jones, they're telling me this is their last day, but you prescribed 28 days and this is only 25. And I would speak to Mr. Jones and what I didn't know was patients in those days and probably now go home and they go to their calendar and they X out each day that they go on for radiation and they might say, okay, five weeks, that's 25 days, 24 days, 23 days, 22 days, 15 days, 14 days, three days, two days, one day, I'm done. And then to have to walk in a room and say, well, Mr. Jones, I I said five weeks, you're right. But what I meant to say was 28 days. So it's five and a half weeks. And I kind of learned that lesson and I guess I must have forgotten it because this young lady 
um, you know, really was very upset. And, and I apologized profusely and I thanked her uh, for this lesson. So um, that marking your calendar is something that we have to always, you know, another example, I'm not a surgeon, but, you know, if someone has you set up for, you know, if you're set up to have your breast surgery done on February 2nd, and on February 1st, you're getting yourself all, you know, emotionally and, and physically and, and, and spiritually ready for this procedure, and you get a call to say, uh, they have to cancel your procedure, you know, these are very, very big blows that really affect you know, the, um, the attitude, the entire visage of, of our patients, of our survivor thrivers. So we really have to make it known to us that things that are not big deals to us can be big deals to them. And also we have to make a promise uh, that we this won't happen again. And I did make that promise and I broke that promise. So now I have to remake that promise. So, but that's okay. Um, so I think I want to talk about a little bit behind the, be, what are the reasons behind these changes? So I use, I like to use the, uh, the Wizard of Oz metaphor because I think a lot of times doctors are thought of as magicians or they are thought of as being, you know, above human and being a little bit maybe below God, but above humanity or that we have magical powers or mystical powers and almost like the Wizard of Oz have has have all these gadgets and gizmos and you know behind the curtain you know they're using he's using all these levers and things to make everyone so afraid of them or or to to bow down to them but really it's just a man you know behind a curtain you know playing with machinery and and that's a metaphor that we use a lot on the podcast so I want to peek behind the curtain and kind of look at some of the reasons behind we. The, your doctors and your care team make these changes. So what actually happens, Angel, from consult to the first day of treatment, first day of radiation, first day of chemotherapy, the first day of surgery. So as I said before, at the time of the consultation, your doctor should explain all the stuff that we discuss on a weekly basis. So many times before staging, prognosis, treatments, side effects. Um, but here's a partial list of what happens between that consult and the first treatment. So the first thing is you go in, you do the consult, and then you leave. And then you do your dictation, you prepare your, your, your consultation, and your staff mails it out. Then you have the first level of discussion with your staff. Hey, I saw this really interesting case. I haven't seen one of these um, salivary gland tumors in a long time. Let's talk about it. Let's do some, um, do some research. You discuss it with colleagues, you're having lunch, or you're at a meeting and say, hey, I saw this really cool case. Let's talk about it. And then you could also go back to radiology and look at the x-rays again, or if you hadn't looked at them before, look at them for the first time. And then you look at all the medical records again, and you re-review them. And then you go and present the case to the tumor board, and you have about 14 or 20 other doctors, nurses, and professionals in the room you know, discussing the case with you. And then you go back and do some more reading. I call that your due diligence. You want to really know that case really well and really know the, the latest and greatest data and clinical trials associated with that um, type of cancer. And then you want to also get the insurance authorization. So many times we tell a patient we're going to give them X amount of treatments. And then the insurance says, well, that's good. You can give them that, but they're only going to be covered for this. So they sort of might be the 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 motivating factor behind the change in the plan. And then you put together your rough, your rough draft. And for me in radiation, we'll go in the back room with the physicists and I'll take a woman that I promise 22 days of radiation to her breast. And then we find out that physically it's impossible because of her geometry that we would actually um, probably harm her if we did the 22 days and we have to do the 34 days. Um, but imagine saying to, you know, having a patient walk in one day and say, yeah, I'm ready for my 22 days. And they go, what well, 22, you're going to get 34 um, because the staff doesn't know what's goes and goes on behind the scenes as well. So, you know, these are some of the things that change as well. And then you have to also last but not least, um, you have to listen to your inner voice. So if you have experience and you've worked decades in the field, sometimes something just doesn't feel right. And, you know, you don't really address it right away because you sort of ignore that inner voice. But then as time goes on, 
that voice becomes louder and louder and louder and louder until you have no choice but to, to listen to it and do some more due diligence. And perhaps that would, um, would uh, create a change. And, um, and that's actually, I have an interesting story I'll share in a minute about said changes, but why are the changes? Why are the changes? Why are we doing this? Um, well, the first question is, or actually the first statement is we are only human. Your doctors, your nurses, uh, we make mistakes and sometimes we do have changed our minds or sometimes the things that we initially think when we first meet you after we're given a bit of time to mull it over, um, sometimes our, our thoughts change. So number one reason, and I'd like to say that this doesn't happen often, but I'd be lying to you if I say that it never happens, is that your doctor is unpre unprepared for the consultation. So the being unprepared can be due to yourself, meaning that you just didn't get in work, you know, early enough. So you could read over your charts for the day, or you didn't check the day before, or you just didn't have the time or an emergency popped up and you didn't really fully evaluate the case before you walked in the room. Or sometimes it could do, be due to, you know, to circumstances beyond your control. You might have a patient come in, but they didn't bring their medical records or their doctors didn't have their medical records sent. Um, or the films weren't available. So in those cases, that's beyond your control. Um, there's also the reality of our day. I mean, you know, a doctor's day is very, very busy. And I don't want to use that as an excuse, but we're always multitasking. Uh, and the busyness, um, you know, is sometimes behind some of these changes where you're seeing multiple patients with the same diagnosis and you mix up the patients and you have memory limitations. So sometimes it's just our human you know, capabilities, what we're able to do um, as opposed to what we want to do. And very, very few community cancer doctors are experts in each subspecialty. Um, we're called the jack of all trades, but the master of none. This is no different. Um, using that salivary gland tumor as an example, um, you know, maybe I see five a year, um, but if you were a dedicated head and neck radiation oncologist practicing at Memorial or Mount Sinai, Maybe you see five or 10 a month, you know, you might, because people will be coming all over the world to see you because that's what you do. Um, so you, we need to also vet the case with colleagues and to, that could take forever. How many times do I tell a patient, well, here's what I think your plan is, but I want to talk to this friend of mine who specializes in this. And then you may put in the first call and then you follow it up with a text and then you feel funny and you wait a few days and you repeat the text and then finally, a week later, the person get back gets back to you. And by then, you know, the patient's almost ready to start treatment and you've made a change uh, because you vetted, vetted the case from, a, from an expert. And, you know, think you could also have an idea after you see the patient. I call this the eureka moment, right? That eureka, eureka moment uh, when, you know, you think you're going to treat a person in a certain way. And then all of a sudden you're sitting there and that light bulb goes on and say, wow, what was I thinking? I could do this better. And then you make the change, but you forget to tell them that you made the change. So again, why the change? Because we're only human. Uh, is there anything wrong with change itself? So the answer to that question is absolutely not. Actually, I think that change in these kind of circumstances can be very healthy. So when you make these changes, it implies to me at least that you still have a brain that works and you have not become a robot where you basically take each case like a cookie cutter. You're still using your brain. Number two, that you still care. The easy path would be to stick with the original plan, uh, most likely still consistent with standard of care. And it's very, very hard to tell a patient you changed your position. Um, that would require you to then go back and rebuild trust and rebuild their confidence, which is not easy. And especially in this day and age, you know, and I, this is the story I wanted to share. So there was a lady who came to me and she had these um, lesions in the brain that the radiologist called metastasis uh, spread from another site. And I put together the plan to treat these brain metastasis. And that inner voice was saying, there's just something doesn't look right. I brought it back to the neuroradiologist, still metastasis. Now, of course, we don't know for sure because we don't have a biopsy, but we utilize 
our best guess estimate. And if it's in the range of 99% sure, um, then we'll go on and treat. So despite getting double confirmation from the oncologist and the neuroradiologist, there still wasn't something right. And we had actually began treatment on this patient and gave this patient one fraction. And I just could have left it alone, but that inner voice was screaming and screaming and screaming. So I brought it to another neuroradiologist who brought down the likelihood of a metastasis from 99% to maybe 40%. So we put on the brakes and imagine that conversation that was not fun. Um, but I just would not, did not feel comfortable um, moving forward with that case. And, and, you know, she was very thankful that I kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And, um, you know, she wasn't thrilled that she got a dose of radiation, but at the same time, I could have given her a full course of radiation and nobody would have criticized me, but that wasn't the right thing to do when that change had to happen. So, um, you know, just again, what are some of the reasons these changes happen and, you know, what, what goes on behind the scenes? And it also shows that you're still striving to be the best you can be. And that, as far as I'm concerned, means that our survivor thrivers will be getting the best care anywhere, whether they're going to New York City or whether they're going to a community center, as long as your doctor never stops trying to fight for you and trying to do the right thing, um, then that's the key. However, there is the only time when it's wrong to make a change is when you don't circle back and tell the patient. So in this particular case, Angel, um, what should have happened was exactly what happened. I didn't like the margin on her case. I needed an extra two doses of radiation to feel more comfortable with being able to provide her a perfect, perfect radiation plan. And I didn't circle back and I should have. And even though in my mind at the time, I didn't think two extra days were a big deal, they were a big deal. So I thank this patient for again, illuminating uh, the necessity of communication and being able to circle back and uh, go over changes. Angel Santana, your thoughts? Well, you know, I've got a question actually um, before my thought, and I think you've alluded to it in the beginning, but I, I want to just make sure I, I, I understand it from my point of view. When you were describing um, the different types of uh, treatments and radiation, the 22, the 35, you know, the, if I'm saying that correctly, um, that of course is based, as you said, by each uh, case. Has it all, um, has it always fluctuated over time or would you say that you know is there like for example are there are there patients that require less than 22 absolutely each case is different and and getting back to that cookie cutter so when your wonderful mother uh, made all that great spanish food for my mother-in-law she followed a general recipe the one that has worked for her for years and years and years and years however if she knew that my mother-in-law wasn't good with salt because she had high blood pressure or knew that she had diet, if she had a sugar problem, maybe she wouldn't make it as sweet. She would make adjustments according to her experience and, and whatever. And I, and I think in a lot of ways, all of our subspecialties, whether they be surgical oncology or medical oncology, you know, you have to make some basic changes or you have to make um, certain considerations for patients. So if I was a medical oncologist and I needed to give you a chemotherapy that was toxic to your kidneys, um, the standard dose would be X, Y, and Z, but because you have bad kidneys, you might have to do X, Y, and Z, only 60% of X, Y, and Z. Or if a person um, was going to have a surger surgical procedure and they wanted to do just say a lumpectomy, which is a partial breast surgery, but a woman's breast was, was very small. And if they did a partial breast and they promised them that partial breast, but then in retrospect, just as they're about to put them to sleep, they say, you know, if I take this much tissue out, I'm really not going to be leaving you much. So let's reconsider this, you know, this recipe. And instead of doing the lumpectomy, let's do the, let's cancel today and we'll do a mastectomy with a reconstruction. You know, these are all parts of the art of medicine, the art of oncology is to be able to know, um, you know, what the standard of care is, what the recommendation is, but then make adjustments as needed. In this particular case, um, 
I was absolutely right. When I first saw her, I gave her what was called the standard of care dose for this particular problem, but I didn't like her margin status. That means that there were cancer cells very close to the margin. And we like to have the cells just say about a centimeter away from the margin. So I just wanted to give that little extra boost in case there was an active cancer cell there just so we'd have a better chance of preventing this from coming back. So I hope I answered that anal that question with the analogy. Absolutely. And I think what's great about it, the answer too, it, it alludes to episodes that we've done here at the Croc Podcast, which is knowing your patient and, and knowing your doctor. And it kind of all kind of plays into one. My last question to you, um, I have questions today. It's interesting. So my last question to you is, I, you, like you said, you know, there are patients and it's on a case by case basis. Have you ever found in your, in your history or your, uh, your, your, your years of service, have you ever found that it's kind of like a two part question a, when you do a 22 or 35 plan that you need to reduce it because it's working at a rapid pace or, well, in addition to that, when you have a 22, 35, let's say you did 22 and you get to 22, would there be a requirement at times that you need to go to 23, 24? Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Except the first part. Okay. So usually say we have 25 and okay. a patient's tumor just melts away. You're still going to get your 25. Why is that? Because you have to give, because you can't look at what's happening right at the moment. You have to look at what's going to be there in six months, a year, three years, five years. Okay. You have to give a certain dose. It's like an antibiotic. You know, your kid has a fever. They take the first dose. They take the second dose. They take the third dose. The fever goes away. And as an irresponsible parent, you would say, okay, we're stopping the antibiotic. And the kid has a relapse and gets sicker than they were when they first started. Gotcha. Um, so you always have to finish your antibiotics. Same as, you know, in your cancer treatment. However, sometimes you do have to increase the number as I did in this case. And there are cases where I have to bring pe people back for a boost because they still have appreciable tumor. So my final thought then is this, as a patient, you see how I have questions. I think the one thing that is important is to really be okay with the, with, with asking questions even if you feel like they're the quote unquote dumb question, there's no dumb question. The dumb one is the one you don't ask. And it's very important that you know who your doctor is, that the doctor knows who you are, but more importantly, that you engage in conversation so you understand what it is you're getting into. And I think this episode hits home to everyone. Great episode. Yeah, no, and I couldn't agree more. And I really uh, emphasize this to all the patients you know, they always think they're bothering you or whatever, and it's never a bother. There's never a dumb question. I can't tell you how many times I've been asked the question, hey, doc, when you irradiate me, can I still see my grandkids? Um, you know, you would think that's a dumb question, but it's really not. I mean, a lot of people don't understand radiation. They don't know that radiation doesn't make you radioactive, but it sounds like a stupid question, but it's a really good question. So there are no stupid questions. I agree. So that's my final thought. I, I think this is a great, um, great episode. And I hope that everyone um, can share it, like it and let them know that we're around because these are the episodes that we, that we air. It's all about you. Certainly. And again, um, I love these kind of podcasts where a patient schools me in, in how to be better um, because really at the end of the day, we're here for you guys. We're here to walk, go into work and take care of you all day. And then uh, once a week, Angel are dedicated to bring you this podcast to make your survivorship uh, that much better, to make your life that much happier, to make you more joyful, to make you know that you have people who really are going to go to bat for you. Um, so my pep talk goes as follows, same as it is every week. Um, you guys are terrific. You're courageous. Uh, you deserve this high level of communication. You need your doctors and your nurses to always be communicating with you about any changes. Life is not, you know, as they say in uh, in Eastern philosophy, you know, life is a river. It's always changing. If you put your, your, your toe in a river and take it out and you put it in the river, two seconds later, your foot is going in a different river. Everything is change and, and it's very normal and it's very organic and uh, very, very natural to have change, but the level of communication then requires to be at a higher level as well. Um, so, you know, you guys have enough going on. You have enough self-doubts, uh, enough issues on your plate with your fears and things and your toxicities. 
But always remember, you guys are strong. You are amazing. You're tough. You are worth it. You're special. You are loved. You are brave. You are supported. You are not alone. You are a fighter. And you got this. On behalf of Angel Santana and the entire Croc board, we always end our podcast with the same blessing, wishing you all a long, healthy, happy, cancer-free life. God bless you. God be with you. Peace.